Hey, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in to the Ideation Podcast. I am super, I mean, like, really super excited for, for my good friend Paul Young to be on today. I think you're going to thoroughly enjoy his insights, his story, um, and uh, we'll dive into that in just a moment. I do want, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Paul Young, he is uh, originally born and educated in Australia. He is the nonprofit partnerships lead at Facebook. In his role, Paul helps nonprofits from around the world raise money and support their missions on Facebook and Instagram. Prior to starting his role at uh, Facebook, he spent four years working on strategic partnerships for Instagram. And this is kind of the fun part. We'll dive into this during the interview. But while at Instagram, Paul led the media partnership strategy for the launches of um, features like Stories, Live, Boomerang, IGTV, and Ranked Feed. He is a veteran of the nonprofit sector. I first met Paul years ago when he was the digital lead at um, a nonprofit based in New York called Charity Water uh, that our mutual friend Scott Harrison started. And he was there for five years before prior to joining Instagram. And in this time, Paul was responsible, was as a member of Charity Water's first executive team for raising over $37 million online to fund clean and safe drinking water projects around the world. So needless to say, Paul, thanks so much for your time. No, thank you, Charles. I'm, I'm stoked for this conversation. And uh, yeah, my accent is thick, so apologies to people listening. My, my biggest problem is when I get excited, I talk even faster. And I know <laughs> that, I know in our chat, I'm going to like, we'll get excited about things. So I'm going to try to like, keep my energy up, but not so fast that uh, people struggle to, to understand me. And I remember when we first met, uh, it was at your ideation conference in yeah. Chicago. I'm not sure the exact year, about a decade ago, but- I think I just, it was 2012 actually. Whoa, okay, yeah, eight years ago. Yeah. Um, but I just remember what a great group it was. Um, there was just interesting for-profit people, really interesting non-profits. Yeah. Like it was one of those conferences where everyone I had a conversation with for a few days was really interesting. Um, and I don't remember the speaker, but there's something I heard at that conference that I've like repeated throughout my life since, which was, I don't remember exactly who the speaker was, but he, he said, um, luck is both the presence of good luck and the absence of bad luck. And the only thing that amplifies both is hard work. Mm. And that just like really landed with me. Like you work really hard, you, you get more good luck, but you also reduce your chances of bad luck. Um, and that always landed with me about luck. So Yeah. I had a great time then ever since we met in person and, and you're always such a great supporter of charity water. So it's good to be, it's good to be having this chat. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for your time. I know um, I remember that event specifically because I know um, Scott had spoken at some of our conferences in the years prior to that. And he says, I have this guy, <laughs> you need to get this guy <laughs> uh, and you're going to love, you know, uh, Paul and uh, tell us a little bit. So you're born and raised in Australia. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you come to the States because of, um, that particular position or what was the story behind that? No. So, um, I, yeah, born and raised in Australia, uh, outside of Sydney with a fair bit of country in my background. So Aussies listening are like, well, this, this is like a thick accent, but I'm, I'm not bunging <laughs> it on. It's a, uh, there's a bit of country there that I, I can't ever get rid of. Um, I, uh, I actually came to America to work in social media. Uh, this was about mm. 2006 and I, uh, I, I was learning, I did my academic studies in public relations and I was learning about social media and the internet industry at the time in Australia was a few years behind the US. Mm -hmm. And so I started in my spare time learning about blogs and podcasting. Right. And we didn't even have Facebook in Australia when I was at, at uni. We didn't have any of these. Uh, YouTube had just started to exist in the country. Yeah. Um, and the thing I, I like to say is that at the time in Australia, people thought a blog was something you did in the toilet. <laughs> um, and so I, I got into this I actually worked in motorsport my first job the Australian version of NASCAR and over night time wow. I go and do this internet stuff I had a blog and podcast and I started meeting all these people in the states getting really interested about the potential for the internet to disrupt communication uh, so I sold my car quit my first job bought a one-way ticket and came to the states met all these people that I knew from my blog and podcasting and stuff like virtual relationships interviewed for a bunch of jobs I wound up in um I was living in Venice for a few weeks in a like 14 bunk bed hostel and spending $5 a day for two pieces of pizza wow. and two espressos. And then I'd have dinner at the hostel and just repeat. And I found out I had a job in New York with a, a, one of the first social media agencies called Conversion and came out and landed and spent a few years there and then fell into charity water. So it was, it's been a bit of a whirlwind, but always like chasing social media has been, been my, my thing for the last 15 years or so. That's wonderful. I mean, for those of you who are listening or watching that don't know, I mean, Charity Water by far really, I think, disrupted the charity space. 
And um, I think Scott had the audacious, uh, you know, uh, the courage to disrupt the space that had, had been fairly antiquated. And um, he brought you on as one of the first executive team members. Uh, and you, you guys really helped launch um, Charity Water effectively. So, you know, what I appreciate about you is like every time like you leave an organization or a company, you take time to reflect and write about the biggest lessons learned. So I thought we can kind of go back in your history a little yeah, bit see. from Charity Water to Instagram and now at Facebook and kind of see the progression of the things you've kind of learned along the way. So let's go back to Charity Water, um, yeah. the uh, organization that helped to bring clean water and still continues to do that very effectively around the world. Uh, and, you know, when you wrote about your experience there, because you were head of digital during a time when I guess we still don't fully know. Uh, digital is just part of everything, integrated into everything that we are kind today. So it feels like almost like that whole offline, online distinction is not necessary anymore. Um, so like for you, when you were back in the day as one mm. of the early, probably social folks that I remember knowing, uh, when you got to Charity Water, like wh what was it that attracted you to, to the yeah. organization? And then what, what did you hope to accomplish when you got there? Yeah, totally. Um, and a lot of this comes back to our friend Scott Harrison, who's just one of the most brilliant entrepreneurs and leaders and, and creatives that, that uh, anyone could ever meet. So if you're not familiar with Scott, uh, follow, follow him and follow yeah. the organization Charity Water, um, brilliant org. Um, so Charity Water, I'd like to talk about, there was, there was a tweet that changed my life and that was in about 2008 and uh, Beth Cantor, um, yeah. who, yeah, who's Just brilliant of, yeah. and, you know, forever has been the, the, the the leader of like knowing what's going on with nonprofit and social media. So I followed her because I was an agency guy who loved social and I cared about the world. And I followed her to, to hear about new things happening with for social good. And she tweeted about like, do you have a September birthday? Check out the September campaign for charity water. Mm. And I have a September birthday, September 18. That's the most common birth month. Um, nine months after Christmas and New Year's. So cold <laughs> in the Northern hemisphere. Um, and I, I remember landing on this beautiful web page and seeing this idea, watching a short film about water in Ethiopia. I didn't know anything about the water mm. issue, couldn't have told you a thing about it. Um, and this idea of doing a fundraising campaign. And mm. back in 2008, 2009, this was very new. Yeah. But for me, as someone who couldn't give a thousand dollars, you know, I was on a startup, a starting salary in, in New York. I thought I can raise some money, and I. I I did a fundraiser and got to know the org. I also got later involved in this thing called Twestable where Twitter yeah. users used to get together just because we were on yeah. Twitter, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which I say that to, to young people at work now and they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, we, <laughs> Charles and I, we both had Twitter. So we, we, we met in person. <laughs> and um, I got to know the org and I just, just fell in love with their approach to digital, their approach to doing charity differently. And then a job popped up to run digital and um, about three different people sent it to me and said, you need to apply, you need to do this. And so I... I took the jump and at the time it felt very risky because Charity Water was 120 people. We had right. a couple of months of money in the bank at the time and we were just growing up. There was all this potential and, you, and the people were amazing, amazing culture, amazing organization. I thought, oh, here's a chance to do something and jumped on and, and yeah, joined a, joined a rocket ship in, in, in the industry. Um, you know, the, the org itself was punching up towards, you know, 100 million raised when I left and um, 100 staff and it's just been going onwards and upwards since it's yeah. doing better now than yeah. when I ever worked there it's been amazing to see so there's a lot of learnings in being there from you know when it was like three or four of us launching a campaign through to being a proper organization a few years later yeah I mean you write you write about this in your reflection but one of the things I appreciated you mentioning is that really Charity Water did a good job of leveraging opportunity versus guilt as mm -hmm. a means of fundraising and, and they would inspire, activate and create experiences. So tell us a little bit about that thinking, because back then that was like a, such a fresh way, instead of making people feel guilty over totally. a situation to give towards something. Yeah, totally. And, and, and we always said that inspiration was the most important part of our digital strategy. Mm -hmm. And I was really lucky there to work with some of the best creatives. Uh, Victoria Harrison, um, who's yeah. Scott's wife. Uh, I always say find a great creative director and marry them if you're a startup <laughs> founder. Um, it, she's actually followed Victoria too. She's doing great um, social. Yeah. She's now consulting and, and launching some amazing um, assets for nonprofits. Um, I just had this creative team who could do amazing things um, through films, through photography, through beautiful design that would inspire you. But the angle and, and opportunity, not guilt was actually an ism that we had internally. So internally for our culture, we built a guidebook 
with new hires, we would take them through these, these isms and little stories. And one was about opportunity, not guilt. But we always thought that we wanted to show the positive of the issue. Like when you bring clean water to a community, you change people's lives. And before there's clean water, it's actually pretty grim. Like people walking, women walking hours to get water that makes them and their children sick and can kill their children through diarrheal diseases. Um, there's a lot of, of pretty bad stuff about, you know, millions of hundreds of millions of people not having access to water, but we would focus on the opportunity and, and the good things that could happen. And in a digital world, we found that really, really mattered. Um, when you look at the old model of charity, a lot of, a lot of the old commercials, like, you know, the old ASPCA commercials, I used to watch them. I had an ex-girlfriend who used to burst into tears at the Sarah McLaughlin ads and like, you'd feel bad or you'd get these direct mail pieces sure. that um, flies around, you know, babies, yeah. like really rough stuff. And that is powerful, but, in a digital world, we kept thinking about, we want to build a movement. We want people to bond themselves to this org and be passionate supporters, make it part of their life if they cared about the water issue. And the only way to do that was to really, you know, light them up, inspire them. Um, mm-hmm. And the only way to inspire someone is through, through brilliant create. No, I, I love it. And, you know, um, but adding a layer to that, I think uh, what you guys did really well, that what they continue to do really well mm-hmm. is, is the fact that, you know, I think you mentioned this phrase in your writing is like, people are good but people are lazy. Yeah. And I think there's so much truth to that. And I love um, totally. in the article, you quote actually the, the founder of Save the Children. And I'm going to read the quote. Yeah. We have to devise uh, means of making known the facts in such a way as to touch the imagination of the world. The world is not ungenerous, but unimaginative and very busy. And my understanding is like that quote's from a long time ago, right? A hundred years ago. That was Eglantine yeah. Jeb. Um, and it's funny because people are good, but people are lazy. It was something that one of the things I just started saying a lot internally with my team when we thought about activating people. And I kind of thought, oh, I'm smart. I came up with this. I like coined it. <laughs> and then I said it once in a seminar in Australia and someone from Save the Children in Australia was there. She came up afterwards and said, oh, it's lovely how you paraphrased our founders quote. I, that's one of my favorites. And I, I didn't know what it meant. And I looked up Eglantine Jeb. She's amazing. She was like, this is a woman in like 1920 who founded Save the Children and like created the idea of many ways the the modern charity complex yeah so but that quote that can apply right now right like, absolutely yeah. not un- unimaginative they're, they're busy it's it's a hard out there but people want to do good mm. um but it, it is it's, it's hard to get to get people off their butts um you know we always would look at people would start fundraising campaigns and when i was at charity water that was our, our big focus now it's all um they're very focused on monthly uh mm-hmm. their membership community the spring which has been really powerful for them but we really thought about fundraising campaigns. We would get people all the way to starting. We would, you know, inspire them, get them through with zero dollars marketing. If we didn't have ads. We would have to do all the work to bring people in. And about half the people that started fundraising campaigns wouldn't activate. Yeah. And we always thought we could change that through little tweaks and it was always hard. And um, to me, that was just, you know, people are just really busy. It's they, they, they lose it, but they want to do good. So for, I think social impact professionals or someone at a nonprofit, it, just keep at it because the audience yeah. fundamentally people want to find a way to help others and want to do good in the world. It's just, you know, there's so many competing priorities in people's life. Yeah. I mean, I love that. It's, it's um, once again, I think falls in line with removing that guilt. It's really, I think people do have a desire, but you almost have to make it so intuitive and it feels so seamless. Like, yeah, of course I would. Why wouldn't I participate? Totally. Like I'm thinking of um, Frontline Foods, um, started by um, Ryan Saba, who's a former Twitter guy, an amazing guy, who's always a charity water supporter and some others. They've just really kicked off here in, in America. I think they're only in America, but during, um, during the COVID-19 lockdowns and the really simple idea, you know, restaurants are closed and healthcare workers need food. Here's an easy way to help in your local community. Mm. Just tie all these pieces together. Now they did a ton of hard work to yeah, absolutely. schedule it, organize it, find the right restaurants, find the right people that need the services. But everyone's sitting at home, and you know you, you're having a rough time when you go to the grocery store, and you're just like, "What can I do for my neighbors?" Yeah. And it's the same principle at Facebook. You know, we just try to make it really, really, really easy for people to make that positive impact, and they'll do it. Mm. Well, I, I love one of the things that uh, you guys did really well at Charity Water is, you know, just the whole peer to peer. And I know to some extent people may be a little bit exhausted, but the driving principle behind that of like, you know, instead of just looking for donors, looking for fundraisers, mm-hmm. um, I think that was like a, when I first saw that, I was like, man, that's brilliant to empower people to become almost like heroes of the story. Uh, where they can, instead of like trying to find specific donors to give to the organization, 
you know, can you unpack that for us a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. And I think we, we, at the time we stumbled into the model and it took off with us. And I think peer to peer fundraising has become relatively commoditized now, you know, everyone's yeah. doing different things and yeah. um, you know, we, we do a huge amount of it with birthday fundraisers on Facebook. Um, it, it's the predominant way people fundraise on platform. Um, uh, so, you know, it really sticks, but the power of peer to peer is that every peer to peer fundraising campaign is a word of mouth marketing campaign. Yeah. And that's the most powerful form of marketing. So if you think, if you pause for a second and imagine that you do, you know, a fundraiser, and Charles, I know you do many of them, but yeah. you do a personal birthday fundraiser this year. You think about who are the five to 10 people you will first ask to donate. Mm -hmm. I guarantee that's the people that you influence most in the world. It's going to mm -hmm. be your immediate family, your closest friends, your right. coworkers, that, that circle. And so we saw this tremendous value in that not only could we convert people into a, a high impact conversion in the financial sense, you know, the average fundraiser was about a thousand dollars for us when they activated um, yeah. charity water, but they would bring in 13 new donors on average. And that was the real power. And the thing we always thought about was okay, well, what's the experience, right? Like, what do you get back? And, yeah. and internally a lot, we would say, make the fundraiser the hero. And I think for any organization, like think about your best customers, your ambassadors, yeah, yeah. like how do you make them a hero and make them look great? Because, if I do a fundraising campaign and I know I've done good for the world, that's one thing. Also, if I, you know, every human has a, an ego and has a desire, you know, to, to feel certain things. Um, if I feel like my friends looked at me in a positive light because of it, that's only going to bond me further and give me more reward, more dopamine to, to go and do more good. Mm. Um, yeah, so I can share a few more examples of that, but the make the fundraiser hero piece is something we always thought about in, in that, that experience of fundraising. Yeah, I think it's powerful. Um, one of my own personal mentors was, you know, has been, you know, Seth Godin. He's always kind of mm. drilled into me, like. Also an amazing charity water supplier. Yeah, uh, yeah, he generous is. Man. And, generous, you know, generous man. He, um, he always says, like, it's not that difficult to get your message out, but it's incredibly difficult to get people to care. And I think what you guys created when you were there was the fact that you created these experiences where people were appreciated. I love the fact that you highlight stories of donors, too. And yeah. And I feel like back then that wasn't as common other than, you know, traditionally like big donors would get recognized with, I don't know, plaques or bricks or awards or whatever, but yep. um, you, you guys kind of took it to another level. Yeah. And a lot of it was, again, a brilliant creative team really helps. But for me, whenever I saw, we would always have these cute kid fundraisers Yeah, and like, you know, a little kid, like a seven year old who wants to fundraise for people across the world to bring them water. Like, Oh, yeah. you can't not connect with that. And, but they would like get inspired, absorb the message and be able to mm. go and promote it in this amazing way. And it's, it's, if you can explain something really well to inspire a seven year old, like then you're doing good mm. marketing, um, <laughs> getting that like passion and that connection. Um, but yeah, making the fundraiser hero was something we always did. Um, I remember in, in probably 09, we typically on our birthday, we made it a big marketing moment in September because birthdays yeah. and charity water was yeah. something we really focused on. And we didn't have something happening in the field. So often we do fundraise in real time, yeah. drill a well somewhere in, in Central African Republic or Ethiopia, yeah. bring a film home and share it to show like in real time, connect people to the impact, to see the impact. And one year we didn't have that and we were tossing around like, what do we do instead? And we decided to make it all about fundraisers. And we did this thing in the office where we decided to make um, thank you video. I remember that. And I remember like, I came yeah. up with the idea with creative. We took it to Scott and we we're like, you know, we could probably do like 50 of them. And Scott being, you know, dynamic <laughs> founder was like, let's do 500. And we split the whole office into pairs. <laughs> I was paired with our, the now CEO, Lauren Letter. And we made, and we researched the people, made them videos in real time, both from like it. small donors through to, you know, massive influencers. Yeah. Like it didn't matter. And that principle, we had volunteers come in and write all these thank you notes. And that kind of ethos was so core to who we were. And I think um, people read authenticity. And if they authentically know your brand cares about them, that that's part of how you stick to us. How do you, how you build that movement? Mm, so good. So good. So uh, I do want to ask uh, uh, one question is like, as, as the organization was taking off, obviously you had several opportunities set before you and, you know, probably a lot of different brands and organizations wanting mm. to partner um, as, as you help lead the organization, like how, do, how did you guys vet opportunities during stages of growth? Cause I think that is a common question is once something totally. starts to become successful, it seems like everyone and you know everyone that ignores you in the past everyone comes out of the woodworks to want to partner with you like yeah. how did you guys navigate that season that was that was always a challenge i mean we had uh we had tremendous energy um mm -hmm. starting from the founder down like scott's the type of guy who would get back from a 
you know, two weeks running around Ethiopia seeing water projects. And then on a Sunday, I would get like 80 emails from him from everything from like, here's an idea for a big campaign to like, oh, I found a typo on the about page. You know? um, so that, that energy would, and passion would stick through. Um, I don't think we were amazing at it in my time there. Like, I think mm. you were reflecting your career and your time as a, yeah, as a yeah. leader. Like, like that was the early times where we just said yes to so many things Yeah. Um, because it's so well-meaning, but a lot of different places you would spin your tires a little bit. I think the organization as it's grown up has gotten much better at focusing. I think for me actually, moving to Instagram from Charity Water was really probably where I learned that prioritization mm. focus because I went from the Charity Water brand that was big in our nonprofit space and expanding, um, yeah. you know, 20, 2012-ish when, when, I, when I moved on, 2013, 2014. Um, but Instagram was a whole new global level. So, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think we were great at it, but also when you're in an early stage, like you've got to take chances, right? You're almost like yeah, a venture I guess capitalist. you don't learn. Like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Do the hundred partnerships and five, like sometimes they're <laughs> obvious, but we probably said yes to a few too many things when I, when I was there um, in, in just, you know, being so hopeful and such a kind of young, like non-seasoned team, but that also led to that unbridled energy that had so many other good things happen. Absolutely. So now let's switch over to Instagram. So you get to Instagram, uh, your role is slightly different. Uh, you start, working in partnerships as well as um, some uh, product development, uh, those types of activities. And so um, you also wrote actually a post about what you learned from Instagram when you moved over to Facebook. So I want to pull some thoughts from there because I think, um, you know, working towards like simplicity mm -hmm. is, is really difficult. And, you know, when people look at an app like Instagram, for example, and I say, man, this is so simple. Why didn't I think of it? I mean, the reality is like, we probably didn't think of it because it took so much work to get to that level of simplicity. Right. So, you know, what are some of the things like your, some of your key takeaways from your time there and what yeah. did you learn about things like focus and simplicity doing less, those, those type of elements? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I moved to Instagram pretty early in Instagram's kind of lifestyle at life, life stage at Facebook, um, mm -hmm. charity water. We've been the first nonprofit to use Instagram. Mm. And we joined really fast because we had great visuals and we were early adopters and we moved fast. So I think I remember I'd always say that the three brands that you knew that joined Instagram in like the first month or so was us, NPR and the Boston Celtics, mm. which the funniest conglomeration. So we were part of the launch of Instagram video. One of the first ads ran there. Um, Kevin Systrom and Mike Krieger were very kind to us. Um, we connected mm. with them early through other donors and they always helped Charity Water. And, you know, we were a visual. We had great visuals and it was the greatest visual app. It was just a, a marriage made in, in heaven. Yeah. Um, so I got to know the team a little bit. And then when I moved there, you know, I was a third person in partnerships. Um, our outreach team, marketing, comms, partnerships, and our community team that worked with, with advocates was roughly like 30 people and the organization itself was probably a hundred within the big Facebook mothership, which was still relatively small at the time. Um, so yeah, some of the Instagram values that really stuck, and this is, I only shared this post internally before. Um, so it's kind of one of the first times I've talked about it outside the walls, but simplicity matters was a key value at Instagram, really key to, to Kevin Systrom and, and, and Mike Rieger, the founders. And something they would say a lot in, in product reviews in even reviewing like comm strategy for a big launch was do the simple thing first. Mm -hmm. And you're right, Charles, in that doing something simple is really surprisingly very, 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 very hard. Yeah. Um, but we would, so a big scale, like an example of, of what this would mean for us is, is like the launch of Instagram stories from a product perspective. Like when we yeah. launched IG stories, it was very simple. There was, it didn't have like crazy face filters everywhere. We didn't yeah. have swipe up links at launch. It didn't have many of the interactive tools that people know and love today, it was just a space to share more moments within Instagram, but it was move fast, be simple, and then let, let, let things evolve. But we would also apply it from a strategy point of view for how we would set goals. Um, we would often, you know, come, mm. I think, especially, you know, smart people in organizations or into strategy, like you can really geek out a couple of these really convoluted metrics and strategies. Yeah. Often being simple about like, what's the most important thing we need to do and what's the easiest way to measure it might get you 90% there. Um, we even on a simple end, like I do it in meetings now. I try to leave every meeting with a partner on like, what's the simplest, like three things we need to do like mm. right now. Mm. And that, that conversation can be really hard or we would do, I would write messaging for our big launches for media partners around the world. And when I first used to write them, I used to write these like beautifully well, you know, structured essays. No one really reads. And my <laughs> boss at the time, Charles Porch, he's an amazing, amazing guy. Um, done amazing work at Facebook and Instagram been there forever. He would always trim me down to just like three things. 
Mm. And so I would take the essay I'd written, we'd get to three simple bullets. That's where we typically land. And that's really the most powerful way to write any messaging I've, I've learned. So yeah, simplicity matters, but simplicity is also very, very, very hard. Absolutely. You know, uh, one of the things that you guys did really well is you actually listened to teens, right? That was one of the big things and still is. And I think that's a true statement for most businesses today. Uh, we have to listen to people who are much younger than we are. Um, totally. And so tell us about like that. I mean, I, I guess, you know, people can make that easy mental connection. I can see why Instagram does that. But there's a principle behind that that I think that's really important is, you know, you really have to know not only your current customers, but your future ones. So 100%. dive into that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I... I, I, I love teens use of social media. Teens, teens use of new communication is just yeah. remarkable and the way you see them operate. Like I've been lucky to, to join research sessions around the world with teens and mm. work with a lot of teen creators. And so my role in media partnerships, we had a, a sports team that worked with all the big sports leagues, an entertainment team that worked with um, all stars in Hollywood, uh, a fashion team that worked with, you know, dynamic fashion influencers, um, news who work with news publishers. So, you know, uh, but a lot of these were like formless business. Like you have a meeting with a sports team or a news publisher, digital marketing, we're all sort of the same. And then we had a, a creators team that worked with these kind of youth creators who often were teenagers. And you know, we have a business meeting with a 15 year old. It's so strikingly different, but also yeah. I just learned they were our smartest users. I'd, I'd leave those meetings like entranced and amazed and be like, wow, you're such a good you know, user of the product, like thinker about audience connection. Like they always were the power users and it was the yeah. same at, at, community scale um yeah i think particularly for us like instagram is beloved by teens and it's a big part of a teen's identity these days like your instagram is fundamental to how you're connecting with the world and yeah. expressing your interest exploring your interest and connecting with other teens and so because of that like the experience a teenager has with the product is leaps and bounds deeper and frankly just more passionately interesting mm. than than you or i um you know we're getting a bit duller as we as we grow up i guess <laughs> yeah yeah no totally agree you know i have i have two teenagers at home and so i'm constantly asking them how they're interfacing i, I notice like their instagram usage is very different from mine uh, how they use it to communicate and you know it's it's definitely a different it's the same platform but the behavior is so different yeah, and, and these this new generation of teens, like they're living on a phone, like like the idea of sitting on a, a laptop or a desktop yeah. is sort of crazy to them. The idea of sitting in front of a TV for a long time, like yeah. maybe not that appealing. And that's just like, that's fundamentally different. Like, like I remember a period where to get more mobile savvy, I tried to just only use a phone and iPad at home for a while. Um, and it was really hard. Like I just wanted <laughs> to type things out. Yeah. But if you know, if you want to be like a teenager, you got to get off any form of keyboard. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's that's a good point. Uh, so when you when you talk about like digital product development um, and you know approaching new products, I know mm -hmm. now we'll take things like stories and live and IGTV and Boomerang, those type of things for granted. Uh, but tell us a little bit. Like, do you have any like stories you can share on like what inspired some of that usage? Uh, mm. Or, you know, how you even think about like product development, like how do you frame that? How do you approach that? What are some things that are running through your head, like initial questions and, and things of that nature? Yeah. And um, I, I've worked with a lot of amazingly uh, strong product managers and I can kind of speak a little bit of their language, but they're always a lot, uh, lot smarter than sure. me. So it's kind of my, my I, d I defer to them. But I think, um, so it's interesting. So at Charity Water, we hired an amazing woman named Deepa Subramaniam as one of our first product people um, and another amazing guy named Pablo Panigua. Pablo's at, at YouTube now and had been um, at Zinger. Uh, Deepa came from Adobe and then she ran digital for um, Hillary Clinton's campaign mm. and is now running the ACLU's digital. And she's a dear friend of mine, just one of the most brilliant product people I've ever met. And when they landed at Charity Water, they had to kind of teach our whole org what product meant. Mm. We were like, what, what exactly is product? And realizing it's this whole idea of, metrics and the user experience yeah. and and building building things that can can scale um then at, at instagram and facebook obviously like product like steer is a tech company mm -hmm. um i think the things i learned um Layla Amjadi, who runs a lot of instagram shopping now she was a partner of mine forever and a, and a good friend and she taught me a lot about like working well with product teams and i think that one of the fundamental things she taught me is not to like I think there's a tendency to like see a specific thing and be like, I want this feature. 
Yeah. Like I want this thing in the app. I want this button. And that can be useful if it's the bug or something. But what's more interesting is the reasoning behind it. Like, why do you want it? So an example would be um, when we launched filters um, on Instagram um, for the first time, there's a lot of desire for just a, from media partners in particular of all stripes, like whether you're a news presenter or a like entertainment star for just a simple filter. I actually have one on zoom right now. I probably look slightly better than I do. That just gives you a little yeah. softening and they kept asking for it. And so one way is like, why? But the, the why was to reduce pressure to post because mm. if you've got 5 million followers and you wake up in the morning, it's a different process to be like, Hey guys, like I'm having a great morning than if it's me, you know, down the beach with crazy hair from a surf. Um, and so it was more about like untangling that, that need. Um, and another way we looked at it, um, I won't go super deep on this, but I encourage people if they're interested to dig deeper is jobs theory and jobs to be done Mm. was something we trained on a bit at Instagram. We'll get really into, but thinking about any product and what's the actual job that you are hiring that product to do in your life. And that was true of every service. Like why live? Like, and a lot of creators hire live on Instagram to connect deeply with fans in a real authentic way. Um, more so than broadcasting, it's all about this close connection. And like, I'm watching a live, I could be like, hi, Charles, you can say hi, Paul in Australia. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, he saw me. Yeah. That's the cachet um, as an example. But yeah, p- people can read a bit about it. It's a very interesting theory, but probably helped me really put a framework around, you know, the, the how of engaging with yeah. product things. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I, I know um, when I took a program with uh, Clayton Christensen, who's kind of the father of, um, you know, disruptive innovation. And he talks about like, what's the real job to be done? And I I think like solving problems like that is what makes products really good is like, you're actually solving for something versus just trying to be creative. And hundred percent. Yeah. I I think one story, you might've heard this in in some of the training you've done as well. I remember we did a training on jobs to be done and uh, they use an analogy of the Snickers bar Mm -hmm. and how, when you look at old Snickers ads, they're completely different from the crazy, like Snickers really satisfies now. Yeah. And when they did user research and went and saw what people were doing, they realized people hire a Snickers for a totally different problem to most chocolate bars. Mm. Like you grab a Snickers when you're at an airport and you're, you didn't have time to get a meal. Yeah. And, and so you, you're choosing a Snickers versus an apple versus a banana versus beef jerky, maybe. Whereas yeah. you're choosing a Milky Way for a completely different reason. Absolutely. And, yeah. and so because of that, they worked that out at Snickers and they put in more peanuts. They marketed the really satisfies line. And that's just like helped that, that dominate the category because it's not even competing in the chocolate category anymore. Mm. And they also thought when they talked about Milky Ways, they, they said that Milky Ways are like molecularly designed to like melt in your mouth <laughs> and disappear. And because it's a little like decadent tree, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. apparently a lot of people have it hiding in their desk and you pull one out <laughs> and it like, so these are, they're both chocolate bars. Yeah. They're not, they're doing completely different jobs for the audience. And if you know the job, that's when you can go and like crush a category like, like sneakers has done. Mm, that's so good. That's a great example. Uh, well, let's talk about Facebook, uh, your current role, uh, and you lead nonprofit partnerships. Uh, what does that mean? And what do you hope yeah. to accomplish? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I moved over internally to work on our social impact team um, where, you know, we've been building a lot of products out for a long time, but the interesting thing about Facebook's approach to social impact is we have a whole product team working in this space. Mm-hmm. So we're not like many organizations in that we have a corporate foundation and we, you know, write checks and like sure. find specific things, write them a check and do a grant process. Like that's great work, but that's not the Facebook way product is re- where you have real impact with Facebook. So we've got a whole team of product managers, engineers, data analysts, designers who are just there to provide more social impact in the world. And so that team does things like builds our fundraising tools, um, raised over $3 billion for charities, um, over 20 countries uh, with 100% every cent we have go through. Um, we, we're helping with blood donations in the US and India and other markets. Um, it's some of our team that does voter registration work and that's scaling up massively. Um, we have a mentoring product. We're doing some stuff in volunteering. So we're building these products and pushing them out there. Um, my team that, that I work on, we try to be the connection point for nonprofits with Facebook. Mm-hmm. So for the largest nonprofits in the world, we're trying to both basically just maximize their business objectives. We want to help them raise money on the platform. Mm -hmm. We want to help them maximize their donor acquisition, whether that's through using Facebook ads, which for many charities is the best place to to drive up their donor list um, or through organic means and just to tell their story and do content strategy. So 
my team in particular, we work with roughly the top 120-ish, it's about how many orgs that we can formally manage. Um, so that ranges from like, you know, St. Jude's Children Hospital to the World Wildlife Fund mm-hmm. to Doctors Without Borders, um, Charity Water, one of my partners, like my old shop. Um, so we're just really there to be their advocates and to both help them learn how the new products work and get more mm-hmm. done and also to hear their feedback and, and understand mm-hmm. like, okay, what can Facebook as a platform do to help, um, you know, with racial justice? And we need to listen to partners to, to be able to, to achieve that. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, if there's a, you know, a person listening to this that runs a smaller nonprofit, it, I mean, what, what like are the distinctions? Like, how do you decide who to work with? Is it really on size or like, what's the criteria behind? Yeah, we, we, we have like a relatively sophisticated data model based mm-hmm. on a whole bunch of factors, but it is really nonprofits are kind of a top heavy market. Like what matters the most, our primary audience is users. Yeah. So it's who do users connect with Got most it. frequently. And there is kind of a long tail of nonprofits that if I walk down the street and I talk to a hundred people and ask them their favorite nonprofit, they're probably yeah. going to hear about 85 big brands and maybe 15, like a local yeah. org or something they're passionately connected with. Um, so push that way, but we're doing a lot on scale. So socialgood.fb.com is our key place where we put a whole mm. bunch of resources out. Um, I just worked on Doctors Without Borders. They're amazing. And they did this amazing Giving Tuesday effort last year where they did a, a page fundraiser perfectly optimized and they did amazing ads and had these huge results. So we were able to package that as a case study and take the thing we learned in partnership with them, drop it on the website so that any nonprofit can look and see, oh, wow, Doctors mm. Without Borders, it's really sophisticated smart or they're a smart digital team here's what they did to achieve it so socialgood.fb.com um, mm. is a really big asset the other thing for smaller nonprofits, if people google uh, facebook blueprint for nonprofits, blueprint yeah. is our sales training yep. we're releasing more um, training resources to scale out the things that we can learn so we've kind of got this tiger team that's like working really closely with orgs to do really sophisticated things and then we can take lessons and take understandings scale them out to the industry is, is the hope. Mm. So when you think about like uh, nonprofit work and how, you know, the platform itself is evolving uh, Facebook, uh, what are some ways that you see kind of down the pipeline? Like what types of things should nonprofits be thinking about right now for Facebook? Because some of them may not know, especially, yep. you know, some of the smaller ones, like, you know, I don't know where to start. Like obviously those pages are really good uh, resources to get started on, but uh, how do you advise organizations when they want to work with Facebook or with the platform and, you know, fundraising or donor acquisition, uh, storytelling, those kinds yeah. of things? Yeah, I think there's probably three pillars to think about here, which are the fundraising tools, organic content strategy, and then um, starting to use Facebook advertising. Mm. And using those three together can drive tremendous value for any nonprofit's business. So the fundraising tools, any nonprofit can onboard. Um, they're all available through a donor advice fund anyway, but you can do a simple onboarding with bank statements and then um, mm-hmm. you appear on platform. 100% every cent will always go to the nonprofit of any donation on Facebook. So we pass mm-hmm. it all through. Um, that means that you can run page fundraisers, you can add donate button posts, you can do a lot yourself, but even more importantly, your audience can can use these tools, can use a donate button. Um, we, uh, my wife and I, well, my wife actually gave birth. Uh, I just kind of, Stood next to her and tried to help. Um, Rats. Thank you. Uh, Eleven weeks ago, and uh, it, during the pandemic, so you know she wore a mask the whole time, which is my, my PSA for everyone. Like my wife can wear a mask during labour. Like you, mm. you got, can all wear one when you go to a restaurant or walk down the street. Yeah. Um, it's important for Americans, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, we had this kind of dynamic thing, and it really connected me with. We were very lucky to have access to the healthcare system we have here. You know, I only got to hold my daughter for an hour after the birth wearing a mask before I had to leave the hospital and pick her up two days later. And, and I was just thinking about, I work with Doctors Without Borders, like, oh, hmm. what a different world. So, you know, I put up a photo of that moment with my daughter for my friends, added a donate button for Doctors Without Borders and people gave over a thousand dollars and to That's connect amazing. and feel that yeah. sense of connection. That's where you can scale out with the tools. So just, it's very easy to set up, but have a look at socialgood.fe.com, have mm-hmm. the tools. Second, organic content. I think people are like relatively familiar with that across Facebook and Instagram, yeah. but you know, really there's so much that you can do, particularly right now with Facebook Live, like a lot of people in Instagram Live, people are at home wanting to absorb content. So I think the best thing people can do right now is 
show how your organization ties into this world we're in right now where we're dealing with a pandemic, we're having a massive upheaval where people are really thinking about racial justice maybe deeper than they ever have before. There's there's a lot happening in the world. Like how does your organization play a role in these debates that matter to people while they're while they're at home? Mm. And then Facebook ads, we have a lot of tools. The the blueprint tool I mentioned is really helpful. Um, you can get such great returns if you just like follow the steps sequentially that you can then increase budget and have more things. And the simplest way is just get a Facebook pixel on your website, get a little advice, test, measure, and yeah. learn. Um, one of the biggest things I've learned in my career is do it wrong quickly with digital. So just get in there and start playing, but yeah. measure it. If it's, if it's wrong, but you measure it, it it's good long term. Yeah. Well, I, I do want to uh, touch upon one last topic before we close. And that is uh, just, just on the idea of partnership. Um, you know, good partnerships, I think, generally take a lot of work. Good collaboration um, takes a lot of work as well. So talk to us a little bit about what you've learned about partnering well. Yeah, the most important thing about partnerships is thinking deeply about partner value. What does your partner get from the partnership? Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're schooled in this Facebook partnerships. It's, it's uh, our, our head of partnerships, Martin Levine, who used to be the COO at, at Instagram and is, is a brilliant leader. She just hammers partner value all mm -hmm. the time. So it's all about how do we give the partner value? What matters to your partner? So I think the first is, is listening, leading with empathy. Um, one of the biggest things, I, best assets that I used to learn about partnerships in my career was a book, um, To Sell is Human by Dan Pink. Mm -hmm. and it changed my whole sales approach. I used to go in, it was when I was at Charity Water and just tell you about Charity Water for 45 minutes and say, what do you want to do, Charles? Yeah. And after internalizing that book, I would start with like, oh, what are you here today? What matters to you? Oh, cool, you've got this conference. Like, what are you trying, who are you connecting with? Oh, you've got an awesome podcast. Like, like, what's success look like? And then if you can win while doing what my, you know, a way I win, we get there. Um, at Instagram, my team, we actually built a partner value framework out about this for all our product managers, where we reflected on like broadly what matters to our media partner audience. And it was really hard to simplify that when it could range from like a German news publisher to an Australian rugby team to like a teenager in LA who's, who's does amazing video cooking videos. Um, for us, it was boiling down to, you know, our, user, our partners really cared about like driving their business, um, whether that was like selling merch, ticket sales, like, you know, people need to make money if you're a professional creator. Uh, growing, um, getting more followers and growing, reaching a new audience is always really important. Engagement, uh, how, how is my audience connecting with me and how am I able to like have this close connection? And the third bucket, we always struggled to like name it really well, but it was a mixture of simplicity and cool. Mm. And it was sort of like, people want to use stuff because it's cool. Like Boomerang made me look really cool. So I liked it and it's fun, <laughs> right? So it's fun, yeah. so I use Boomerang. Um, and, and it needs to be easy because that changes the whole ROI. If it's really easy for me to do something, I can give you more. So that was sort of our framework, but it led from a place of empathy, understanding, deep listening, and, and your job as a partnership person is to understand your partner and mm. have them win. That's, that's basically what you exist to do. Mm. I love it. Do you, have, do you have any closing thoughts like, you know, uh, say someone's running a smaller nonprofit and, you know, our, our audience is pretty diverse. There's entrepreneurs and executives mm. of brands and it's kind of mixed, but we definitely do have a, a good amount of like social entrepreneurs um, tracking with the content. Uh, given what you know about what's coming down the pipeline without giving anything away necessarily mm. is um, what word of encouragement would you give those trying to do good and engage yep engaging in a uh, in a digital world totally so i can't really talk to internal metrics but i've been inspired seeing the outpouring of good that's been happening on the platform yeah. um over the past few months of the, the spikes in fundraising and people connecting with nonprofit organizations and following them um the follower growth that we've seen for you know some amazing racial justice orgs like mm -hmm. um equal justice initiative and others yeah. has been phenomenal and seeing that people care enough to, to go and learn yeah. the same way the times book list has changed so as the like social followings and that's that's powerful people want to learn i think um at a critical time like this like meeting your audience where they are and with what they care about and showing how they can partner with you to do good people want that you know people want to find a moment of connection we can all feel a little powerless like okay, I've been at home, I go out to the grocery store, um, how do I feel, you know? Like, yeah. uh, I put out my bins and I, I my uh, trash cans, American. Um, <laughs> I put out my trash cans. And, uh, you know, people are 
getting my bottles and cans, you know, and I see that and I'm like, oh, that's, you know, they're having a hard time. How do I help those people? Um, so I think inserting yourself and showing the path is really important. Um, and there's easy ways to do that with content. I think one of the things that we have on Facebook right now that people aren't probably fully aware of from a brand point of view is the um, coronavirus info hub. Yeah. Um, so it's the COVID hub that you can see, but people can post a local message up to 50 miles and offer for help or request for help. So if you're trying to do good for people and you can mm. communicate there with a local audience, really powerful. And there's people going yeah. to that page being like, I want to help. What can I do? So yeah. I think simple things like that or simple things like use Facebook live, use Instagram live, take questions, take connections. But I think every org that's doing good right now, they're doing good in, in an even more important way. Um, share with your audience how that matters and give them a path. And the good thing on Facebook is you can give them a simple tool. Like I can throw up a fundraiser or a donate button. Um, in Ireland, we're seeing this cool thing right now where people are doing fundraising challenges where they're forming Facebook groups, all starting fundraisers together and kind of egging each other. I'm like, imagine a big mm. group of Irish. And I try to, I kind of imagine them like a virtual <laughs> pub with Guinness because they're Irish. Um, <laughs> and, and they're connecting to see how they can fundraise with each other yeah. and, and who can do the best and who can share in different ways. So. People want to do good. Um, you know, they're just, they're busy. Uh, maybe, you know, people who do good, they're a little lazy too. So get out yeah. there and give them some easy options. Yeah. Well, Paul, thanks so much for your time, uh, your work. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, keep up the good, good work, friend. I, I, I love, I love who, what you're about, who you are. And I think a lot of, you know, uh, impact will be made because you stay focused. Mate, mutual admiration, mate. Always loving what you're doing and, and, and the good you're doing in the world. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks.